Okay, hi. Uh, well, okay. Uh, my name is Christopher Nicholson. Uh, I'm going to talk about distributed programming today. Uh, I'm a PhD student at three universities in three countries because that's how simple this is. And uh, so I'm at the Université Catholique de Lyon in Belgium, uh, Technico in Lisbon, and uh, Northeastern, most recently, Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. So to get right into it, building distributed applications, we're all doing it. Uh, it's hard, we all know it's hard, uh, and there's a lot of researchers working on the problems. Um, to kind of summarize the challenges here, uh, normally what we do is, you know, we'll deploy a bunch of servers, we'll, pick, we'll typically pick some Amazon region here, let's say I, I've picked a Los Angeles data center for instance, and I deploy all my cloud services there. Now the challenge here is that when we're building distributed applications, our users, if they're using mobile devices, are all over the world. And so it's kind of unfair, you know, especially if you're playing a game, if the user that's in Auckland, New Zealand, and the user that's in Paris, France, is competing with round trips with the person who's in Kansas City, for instance. And so typically what researchers and practitioners do today is, is they geo-replicate their applications. So they, app they replicate their entire application to, let's say, the European availability region and the you know, Singapore, the uh, uh, Asia Pacific region. And so kind of the challenge here is consistency, right? And so if we had kind of the ideal, the gold standard, the geo-replicated, consistent, strongly consistent database, like if you were Google and you had a system like Spanner, well then it'd be really easy because I could, I could just deploy my servers wherever I wanted them, I would deploy the same copy of the application everywhere, and I would use a leader election algorithm like Zookeeper or Paxos or something like this to basically totally order all of my events in the data center, and then I would run another Paxos group across my data centers Hello? Okay. All right, so this will be slightly more exciting and challenging. And so, uh, and so I would run a, a, a Paxos group uh, using my leader nodes, geo-replicated, uh, across the geo-distributed data center, and I would then totally order my events there. And so this is really nice because I have a global total order of events, and I have a local in each data center total order of events. This is the ideal. What do we know about the ideal? Well, the problems here are, are pretty clear. Um, well, first, the benefit is that having a total order across all of your events, whether in the data center or whether if it's locally, allows you to succeed at imperative programming. And what we mean by that is that if you imagine all of the copies of your database all over the world as kind of a distributed shared memory, you can mutate locations with transactions and things will happen in order and you can look at your program and you can look at any copy of your data and all of it is going to be perfectly consistent. The nice guarantees that this transactional system gives you is that you get these two very important properties of the kind of asset transactions, the first being atomicity, which means that you can atomically, all or nothing, commit groups of items, and you do not see, you know, you see all or nothing. You don't see some subset of the changes being committed. And second, the strong property of isolation, or what's referred to in database literature as serializability, which means that you do not see intermediary states. And so you can think of this as every operation happens and is mutually excluded from one another. So this makes programming at the geoscale very easy. Now the key insights here, obviously, this is slow. If I have to wait for communication with data centers located all over the world, I'm going to be waiting a while because the speed of light is not changing at any time, you know, in the near future. But the benefits that we get is that it's really easy to program. We can take a program that runs on one machine with multiple threads using locks. We can deploy it geo-replicated using transactions that are serializable and atomic. And then everything will just work fine. So this is great. The problem is, if one of these things goes down because there's a network partition or a failure, well, the whole system is going to potentially, in the effort, in, in, to preserve safety, will sacrifice liveness. Now, that's the ideal. What's the reality? Well, if you're building applications today, usually they're not all the same thing. They're usually running different pieces of software. Those, program, those different pieces of software have different guarantees. Usually, all of your machines communicate with all of your other machines, and that means that you don't really have a well-defined order of events, or you have some arbitrary total order, I mean, uh, partial order. And finally, you know, all of the systems you're using probably use different replication protocols, whether you're using Redis, or Zookeeper, or RabbitMQ, or whatnot. And this means that even globally, you don't really know anything. You can't really say anything about when events will be visible. 
One service could send one event to another replica, and another service may not send an event. So the reality is weekly consistent microservices, how do we write a program? We don't really know what we can expect from the ordering and visibility of events. Second, if you're using all these different microservices, how can you even get transactions? Um, there were transaction kind of proposals in the 90s, systems like X XA, they said, you know, you can interrupt with systems, two-phase command. Nobody uses that, everybody writes their things in Go. It's the reality of it, right? And so the key insights here are that this model is fast, it's fast to develop, but it's fast to execute. Um, really difficult to program. Every service needs failure handling, you gotta learn about these things with like definite IDs and deduplicating messages, and you have to think about what exactly once means, is exactly once even a thing? I don't know. But what's very nice about this is that you get really low latency and under failure, everything's available. So these are kind of the two sides of the spectrum. So let's talk about history. So I love computing history, I love distributed systems history because everybody already solved everything for us. And you know, that makes it really hard to get a PhD. Um, but if we go back in time to 1988, a mere four years after I was born, there's a system by one of my favorite researchers of all time, Barbara Liskoff, called Argus. It's a fantastic system. It's amazing because she kind of solved microservices long before anybody else did, uh, at least in the distributed context. You know these things called RPCs? They make calls to guardians. What are guardians? They're, they're objects. You can change their state atomically. You get guarantees of sequential consistency. And if you want to reorder things to exploit execution order, but you still want to maintain program order, she invents this thing called a promise. Wow, what a novel concept, 1988, what is this? Now you probably don't even know of a programming language that doesn't have the concept of a promise. <clears throat> the way she deals with atomically changing state is she uses a transaction protocol across guardians. This transaction protocol can mask omission failures and RPC failures by using nested transactions inside of that that can roll back using multi-version concurrency control. It's really neat. Unfortunately, the system has no adoption. Um, turns out that promises, really good idea, everybody uses them now. Nested transactions, multi-version concurrency control together, really bad idea, nobody ever wants to touch it again. So you see how these things kind of evolve. Now, a little side note, uh, the system Clue, actually the language Argus was built on, uh, is the language that iterators in Ruby came from, and the X Windows system was designed to be a graphical debugger for Argus. So, let alone computing history facts for you. So, fast forward to 1994. This is when distributed Erlang hits the scene. What does it say? Well, we don't want RPCs. We want to have message passing, but you can emulate RPCs. So, let's be asynchronous, but let's give the illusion of synchrony. So this is kind of a departure from the list.model. model. Instead of being able to transact across actors, you just make actors kind of model a database, you can do transactions across them, you get strong consistency, turns out distributed Erlang's database fails in horrible ways where it loses your data sometimes, so don't run it at geoscale. But what's interesting here is that just by changing the model a little bit, making some things asynchronous where they're synchronous, still exploring transactions, you get massive success. Look at this, there's AXD 501, first system to ever achieve the mythical, whatever they say it was, 99th. You have WhatsApp, 30 servers handling however many messages globally, worldwide, written by however many engineers. And you have systems like React that I worked on at Basho that run not only League of Legends, part of League of Legends, the Danish National Healthcare Service, and the National Health Services in the United Kingdom. So fast forward to 2018. So I focus on 2018 because 2018 is the year that Orleans introduced transactions, but Orleans obviously predates this by quite a bit. But what Orleans says is, all right, let's make the actors transparent, but let's go back to RPC calls, we'll assume synchrony, and then allow you to add asynchrony. So kind of reversing Erlang's decision on the model, giving you asynchrony where you want it. Transactional actors, so any actions across cloud storage, any type of cloud storage, you could run a transaction. These transactions guarantee serializability, two-phase locking, two-phase commit. Really strong guarantees you can run a transaction on Azure between two actors. Really phenomenal work. And within Microsoft, this has a lot of adoption, uh, powering things like Xbox Live and games that you may be familiar with, such as Halo and Gears of War. So what have we learned historically? Well, what's interesting here is that 
Total order and serializability are the gold standard. Everybody wants this, right? Events are in order, mutual exclusion, things are easy. We know this is difficult to perform at scale because locking protocols will either deadlock if the network completely fails or will hang for an arbitrary long time if the network fails and then recovers at some unknown time in the future. We know that there's tons of other NoSQL systems and things that provide weak isolation and weak guarantees, and we know all these things are, have been successful in isolation, but how do we know when we can use it? So we want to get the best of both worlds here. We want isolation, we want serializability when we can have it, when we need it, and we want to exploit weaker things when we know we can without affecting things. And so the question here is that, is a total order really needed for everything? Can we detect precisely where a total order might be necessary? Can we weaken things so that we don't break the illusion of a total order and get better performance by using things like weak isolation, weak ordering? And most importantly, how do we know what can be, how, how do we know when we can do it? All right, so let's talk about how we know when we can do it. So it all comes down to application correctness. So, totally ordering an event, is expensive and hard to do under failure, like we said. And the key insight here is that total ordering is unnecessary for many operations that you want to do. Many operations you can get by with weaker ordering. And we know provably some operations need consensus. And so the idea here is that we can use weak ordering when we know that our application will remain correct. And for instance, we'll talk about this in more, de uh, more detail in the next slide, we'll know that certain types of application invariants, such as uh, invariants called precondition invariants, require consensus or a total order. Okay, so somebody made a comment earlier about property-based testing and they brought up Eiffel and Bertrand Meyer. I thought that was really interesting. It's very similar, and you're gonna find some very similar connections in this, because it is about this. It's about core logic. It's about having preconditioned invariants, I mean preconditions, it's about having postconditions, and it's reasoning that if your precondition is true and your postcondition remains true, that your application invariant will be preserved. And so I'm going to talk about what we consider to be the three types of invariants that you have in applications that will be distributed today. So the first is relative order invariants. So we can think of this as sequencing operations, A and B. And so if we say that some condition A becomes true, or P, if some condition A becomes true, and we only want to perform B if A is true, and we know A is a condition that will stay true, then we don't need to have consensus for this. This can be done under weak ordering. And so for instance, if I want to mark an order as fulfilled, and then eventually I want to deliver all my fulfilled orders, as long as I mark the order fulfilled and know that that has been done, I can do the following update, and the following update will always be safe. Now, this only works if you have causal ordering. So if your network guarantees relative ordering of operations, so ordering of operations with respect to one another, but not necessarily totally ordering them, you can do this. Now, the second invariant is the kind of atomicity invariant, and this says that if I want to do a bunch of things together and have them all occur together, then such as, you know, to give you an example, like if I want to mark an order as fulfilled and decrement the quantity and I want those things to be observed together, you can imagine my invariant is that all of the items that have been shipped in the order equal to, you know, equal with the total quantity is the quantity remaining. I can do this without coordination. And I can do this simply by sending the updates in a batch together. So I don't need to get agreement from everybody on this. Now finally, the last one, obviously the tricky one, precondition invariants. You think of this as if and else. Compare then set. So if I want to update an object based on a condition and that condition is not stable, for instance, if I want to have one item in the stock left and I want to ensure that nobody buys an item that I can't ship immediately, then I need to coordinate. And the reason I need to coordinate is because two people concurrently can be trying to buy the last item and unless I mutually exclude those operations, I'll run into a situation where one person will buy the item that's no longer there. And so the idea here is that weak ordering is sufficient on invariants that we call AP invariants. These are invariants that only need kind of causality, which can be provided under AP, and only need to uh, have matches of groups go together. And the second type of invariants, which we refer to as cap-sensitive invariants, kind of coming from the cap, uh, cap theorem, says that coordination is needed for these invariants to hold. 
Okay. So now I gave you kind of the landscape of, of what we what kind of our ideal way of building distributed systems are. What I'm going to do is present a research agenda, and this research agenda is going to be the work that me and my colleagues have done um, working towards building systems that have these properties. So we're going to assume that our system is built on a actor language here, such as uh, the Beam, Erlang, or Elixir. We'll assume asynchronous message passing between actors. We're going to build a communications layer on top that's going to provide reliable messaging with ordering guarantees that works for a large number of clients at geoscale. On top of that, we're going to build a consistency layer for handling conflicts, so if, uh, if conflicting operations happen, how do we deal with them? and then provide transactional support. And then finally, the last kind of piece is, we need to know when we have to coordinate. And so we'll briefly talk about some work in the static analysis area that will allow us to know when an operation provably needs consensus. So we're gonna focus on this layer today, which is the majority of the work that I've been doing for the last two years, and is the subject of my tutorial tomorrow, well, part of it. Okay. <laughs> So communication, so uh, we're gonna talk about a system that I've been working on, this system is called Partisan. And uh, Partisan is a replacement for Distributed Erlang. So if you're not familiar, Distributed Erlang is a system for allowing groups of Erlang nodes to communicate with one another. In this model, all nodes communicate with all other nodes in the system. To detect failure, nodes will periodically heartbeat their neighbors, and they'll consider a node failed if the node has dropped a particular number of heartbeats. Uh, it will provide single hop point-to-point -point messaging, so as you see by this topology diagram, any node can message any other node with a single hop. Nodes will communicate with one another, so each node can run several actors or processes on it. Nodes will communicate with one another using, uh, using a single TCP connection established between the nodes. And finally, it's assumed that a single network topology, this all-to-all -all communication, is ideal. It's one-size-fits-all. Right? So, First thing I'll tell you is, single TCP connection is a bottleneck. If you've ever run React, you probably know that already. <laughs> uh, all to all, heart beating is expensive. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of academic work, such as systems like console that use the swim algorithm to try to avoid all to all heart beating without, uh, without having no bound on how long it takes to detect a failure. And finally, I'll tell you that distributed Erlang is not one size fits all. So, what is our work? So our system is a system called Partisan. This has been about the last two years of my life working on this system. Um, it is an alternative distribution layer for Erlang and Elixir applications that can run alongside distributed Erlang. Um, it provides point-to-point -point messaging failure detection just like distributed Erlang does. Um, it provides best effort message, guarantee, uh, message delivery, so asynchronous message passing. Um, and it provides callbacks so you know when nodes have failed and you can take action. Um, one of the notable features of Partisan is that it has a pluggable network topology. We'll see what that means. This is all done at runtime. You do not change any aspect of your application. It's done automatically for you. And each of these uh, backends provides various optimizations. We'll briefly talk about these. Specifically, the runtime comes with algorithms for computing spanning trees lazily and for providing causal messaging and unreliable delivery. So let's talk about the backends. So first off, we have a backend, it's called the full mesh. The full mesh looks exactly like distributed Erlang because it is our reference implementation to make sure that we didn't screw anything up. And so uh, all of our tests run using this. The notable difference here is that gossip about who is in the cluster is, uh, membership is gossiped to all the nodes in the cluster using a CRDT. And instead of heart beating, we maintain active TCP connections. And when those TCP connections drop, we, we consider that a failure. So this is more efficient than the heart beating technique. Uh, finally, yes, uh, this is exactly the same as distributed Erlang. The major difference is we did it as a library. We did not write a bunch of C code in the runtime because I despise writing C. Um, the second topology we have is a topology called client server. So like I said, this is runtime specified. You don't change anything about your application. You take the same application, you say, I want the network topology to be client server, and your nodes will organize automatically like this. So your clients will talk to your servers, and your servers will talk amongst each other. And when clients want to send messages, they route messages through the server. So the server serves as rendezvous between clients and server, uh, clients and other clients in the system or other servers. Um, again, failure detection, same mechanism, no open TCP connections. We consider things failed when connections drop. 
And kind of the one that we spent about a year working on is one that's called Hyperview. It comes from uh, the paper with the same name. And Hyperview is the one that is really neat. So the Hyperview backend supports large-scale networks. It's designed and been evaluated in a simulator for 10,000 nodes and beyond. We've operated it empirically on Google Cloud Platform and Amazon, whatever it was, EC2, at uh, anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 nodes. We're hoping that by the end of the year, we'll be at four to 6,000 nodes. Um, and the way this works is, to achieve this scale, all of the nodes need to not know about all of the other nodes in the cluster. This is the thing that gives you the big scalability. And so the way this works is that the green arrows designate active connections, or the active view. This is usually ordered in the numbers of tens of nodes you know about. And then they maintain a view called the passive view, which is used to repair nodes in the active view when nodes in the active view fail. And so this is usually logarithmic on the maximal size that you want to support in the cluster. And what happens here is that this cluster will compute this unstructured overlay graph in a decentralized manner, and will try to optimize nodes out as it can, and, and it will continue churning and optimizing until the graph forms a single connected component, so that all nodes can reach all other nodes transitively. Um, failure detection, again, you're going to hear this over and over, it's, it's, it's TCP connections. But what we also do is we maintain TCP connections to some members in the passive view, so when a member in the active view fails, we can swap it out with a member in the passive view and reorganize the network and continue to churn until we can reach a single connected component. Now, there is some nuance in this algorithm because uh, it is probabilistic. So a node under a really fast churn, so I like to save money because I'm an academic and they don't give me very much. And so when I wanted to run an experiment with 2,000 nodes, I'm like, can I bootstrap a cluster in five seconds and then shut it all down and only get billed for a partial hour? Well, uh, it turns out when you add and remove things really, really fast, some people get evicted because the optimization algorithm is like, doesn't know what's going on, and it will boot some members out. And so for systems like this to succeed, you kind of have to, under certain adversarial conditions like high churn at extremely fast rates to save money, you have to kind of tweak some things. But so the algorithm is probabilistic, and our strategies for dealing with that is that when nodes get disconnected, they reconnect, and normally the graph stabilizes. Um, finally, and we're going to talk more about this, but as of uh, about a year ago, or no, as of about four months ago, uh, our Hyperview system only allowed nodes to message other nodes that were directly connected. And we'll change that today. All right, so let's talk about optimizations. So once you have this, once you have this kind of network topology, you gotta optimize it, you gotta get better performance. And so the first thing that we did was we decided a single TCP connection is not enough. And so what we do is we enable multiple TCP connections between all the peers to enable parallelism. Um, this allows us to partition different types of traffic based on partition keys. Uh, it allows us to do automatic routing based on process IDs that give us kind of best effort FIFO guarantees between senders and receivers. And finally, this is really optimal for high latency applications because if a, if a particular TCP connection is slow and you're in slow start or the window is closing or something like this, uh, having multiple connections to be able to do parallel sends where you have bandwidth available but not necessarily at the lowest latency cost, for instance, if you're sending from Virginia to Japan or something like this. And so to kind of get an intuition of how this works, you can just imagine that we can partition our traffic for process one on one connection, that traffic is isolated from traffic on process two and three, and uh, we can do this as much as the network allows. Now, sometimes it's not just automatic partitioning of traffic, sometimes we actually can be much smarter about it. And so we want to isolate particular types of traffic patterns from other particular types of traffic patterns. And this is to alleviate a phenomenon that's called head of line blocking. And so in head of line blocking, the situation you run into is that if you can imagine you have somebody setting really, really fast, and you have somebody setting really, really slow, and the fast sender is setting really big objects all the time, the slow sender is going to have problems and get stuck between the fast sender's large objects. Mainly because even though latency is high, the real cost you're paying here is serialization and deserialization on the wire. And so uh, in React, the, the gossip data, which stores the hash ring for understanding the topology of the network, uh, gets large really quick. And so traffic that's updating objects in the database, we don't want to get stuck behind traffic that's just maintaining the cluster, passive cluster traffic. 
And so it turns out if you do something like this, you can actually get significant performance boosts as well. And so we allow the user to customize how they want traffic partition by type and by connection. And so uh, you obviously can combine these options. We love composability. We study programming languages after all. And so finally, uh, the last, the last uh, optimization we have here is a feature called monotone channels. And so monotone channels are interesting because a lot of data patterns, such as objects that use a large hash ring that grows over time, anything that uses timestamps or vector clocks, or for instance, uh, large objects where you know that like it's you know a data structure that's always growing because you're only adding to it. What we can do is when as things start slowing down on the wire, we can start to shed objects. So this should be red, but hopefully it is. Uh, what we can do is as sending starts slowing down, if you send me an object to send on the wire and I've got one queued up to send on the wire that I haven't been able to send yet because the TCP window is small or, or something like this, what I can do is I can drop the extraneous objects because I know that this last object I received subsumes all previous objects. And so this is really nice when dealing with a system like React, again, where the ring is constantly growing over time. Okay. So that's kind of where we are today. So now I'm going to talk about uh, kind of new things that we're doing. So this will be in the next release of Partisan. I've been working very, very hard in my grad student room. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can get the benefits that we need to support the architecture I told you about in the beginning. So the first feature uh, that I'll highlight is a, is a transitive message delivery feature. So like I said, with HyperRPU, you only can send to nodes that are directly connected. But what if I want to write an application that I want to run under multiple topologies and I always want to be able to send to anybody else in the cluster without thinking about it? And so this is a challenge because the, the overlay is constantly optimizing and churning, and we have to know how to get a message to one place or another. And so the way that we do this is we assume that we take an unstruct we take our unstructured hyperview-based overlay here, and what we'll do is we'll pulse objects. We'll pulse objects through the network um, and monitor Nodes that receive, well, nodes will monitor themselves to identify paths that are coming, uh, path, uh, that are objects that are coming through multiple paths, and we'll prune those paths. And so, what this allows us to do is decentralize, in a decentralized manner, we're able to compute a spanning tree in the network, which ensures that we send no duplicate messages when we want to transmit things, and we have a path from one node to every other node in the network. And so, once we have this tree, and we constantly are adjusting and repairing this tree as the network is churning, what we can do is any node that wants to route a message to some other node that it knows is a part of the network, but it does not know where that node is, we can send this along the tree. So again, I highlighted that the system uses best effort delivery because under certain levels of churn, so certain percentages of churn, we may just miss the node. If the node is churning as we happen to reach the leaf that that node was connected to that has now become a leaf node. And so this gets us pretty good reliability on message delivery under failures. Um, but like I said, under kind of bad network situations, it can be problematic. So the second one is a master student I've been working with, um, Bruno, who has worked on a system, uh, has worked on implementing an algorithm that's called XBOT, which is called bias the overlay topology. And what this does is it tries to it tries to bias the overlay towards some sort of metric, some oracle, some sort of optimization metric. So if we assume here that not all of the paths between nodes have equal cost, so we see here that the path between this node and this node is 10, but the path between these two is two, and our transitive path to the other node is one, we can perform a four-step optimization pass where we ask the node, can I optimize you? It will reply, and then it will attempt to repair its local view to perform the optimization. And what this allows us to do is swap out the higher cost links with lower cost links using these active and passive views to try to bias towards a metric. And so this metric here can be latency, but the metric can be an application specified metric that allows us to skew towards some other thing. It just has to be a total order where the values are comparable. So the next big feature that I've been working on is causal order. So everybody wants causality. Causality is great because it gives you relative order at relatively low cost. Uh, and so what does this mean? So between two nodes you have FIFO, which means that if I send you a message, those messages will be received in order. And what causality does is it generalizes this to say that it's also the transitive ordering between other messages in the system. 
So this is very important when you have an overlay where messages can take multiple paths because the network is changing, because FIFO guarantees do not hold if the network is constantly changing and you're transitively delivering messages to other nodes. And so we assume we have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice will send a message to Charlie. That will be message A. And Alice will send message B to Bob. Now when Alice sends message B to Bob, we know that B has a causal relationship to message A. It happened after the FIFO guarantee holds on that connection. Now, if Bob was to send a message to Charlie with message C, and that message happened to arrive before message A, this would violate causality. And so, message A should not be delivered before C. Message A should be delivered, uh, sorry, message A should not be delivered after C. Message A should be delivered before C. And so what this causal ordering algorithm does is, at some cost, will ensure that these messages are properly delivered, respecting causal order. Now, there's a clear problem here, right? What happens if message A never arrives because of a network partition? Well, in order to preserve safety, the system will not allow, it won't allow progress. It will, it will not be live. It will prohibit the delivery of any other message that's a causal dependency of A. And that's basically any message C sends to anybody. That then references back to C. So what do we need? Well, we need reliable delivery. So, both reliable delivery and causal delivery are features that we've added into Partisan that are either per message or per channel. Um, so causality, what you do is you tag objects into groups, and senders have groups of messages that they send on, will causal order all messages within groups. And then you can selectively opt in for per channel or per message acknowledgements. If you're using causality, it says that for all messages that are causally ordered, you need to have reliable delivery. A reliable delivery is pretty simple. What we basically say is that, you know, a message is basically stored in a buffer, the buffer is durable, we won't remove the item from the buffer until we receive an acknowledgement, and we'll continuously retransmit the message until we have an acknowledgement. And so your application, at least at our current implementation, has to support at least once delivery. So we're not implementing the identifiers for you, that's an application concern, but at least you'll know that you'll get at least once delivery. So, uh, that basically wraps up our work on the communications layer. So Partisan is an open source library. It has some adoption. Um, it's got some adoption in the open source community. We've got a couple of commercial users of it. Uh, and so this is really nice. So this stuff's ready to go today, and the new features will hopefully be in the new release uh, in the next month or so, where their PR is being code reviewed now. So what I'm briefly gonna do is talk about the last two squares here, the consistency layer to highlight some other interesting work that's going on, and then the application layer to highlight the consensus piece. So you can understand the whole picture of effectively what my thesis hopefully will be. So consistency. So you know when we have this, if we don't have the total order, we don't have serializable transactions, and we use causal order, we're ultimately going to run into updates that happen at the same time that are gonna conflict with one another. And so to mitigate this, uh, what we do is we build on top of CRDTs. You may or may not be familiar with them, but you can just think of them as abstract data types that have merge functions, so conflicting updates always can merge to a value. And if you're interested, I'm giving a whole workshop tomorrow on that. And you can think of it as this. So if Alice is adding one to a set without coordination, Bob is adding one to a set, and then removing one from the set without coordination, and then they exchange messages, the problem is, is that how do I resolve this to something that makes sense? And so one type of CRDT, which is a concurrent addition win set, would say, well, it's simple. The answer is one is in the set because Alice added one and Bob added one and removed one and Bob did these operations before he witnessed Alice's ad. And so Alice's ad should win, should stay because Bob never observed Alice's ad to be able to remove it. And so these data types come in a variety of flavors, but the general idea is that with weak ordering, we have to deal with conflicts, and this gives us a strategy for a kind of dealing with these conflicts in a, in a programmatic fashion, so you don't have to, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, uh, IACAL or whatever, when it pops up that dialogue, and it's like, hey, you modified this object in two places, and I can't tell you what the changes are, here's the timestamp that maybe makes sense, pick one. So, this is much better than something like that. Now, once you are able to modify one object, you need the ability to modify multiple objects at the same time. And so a protocol that my group worked on a couple years ago called Cure is a protocol for highly available transactions. So these fulfill our second property, where you never need to coordinate, uh, you never need to totally order transactions, and you get atomicity guarantees. 
And so we think of Alice and Bob here, uh, and what we do is uh, Alice says, I would like to increment a counter and add one to a set. This is packaged together in a transaction. Those operations will be shipped. And then these black lines represent kind of the causal frontier here. And so at this stage, Alice, whenever she reads, she will know that she always sees the effect of her own rights because causality guarantees that. Now, if Alice runs a transaction to increment again by one and add something to the set, and then Bob attempts to decrement by one and remove one from the set, this is a bad example because that should be adding something other than one. That's debugging slides in real time. And the idea here is that when all the updates are applied, the conflicting operations here that happened at the same time, the increment and the add and the decrement and the remove, these two operations can be merged. And so this is really nice because it prevents aborts it gives us relative order visibility, so you always see the effects of the updates that you've done. And operations can always be merged on data types, as long as you have the data types. So here is a nice transactional solution that doesn't require total order. So to kind of summarize the consistency section, CRDTs, which I'll talk about more tomorrow, enable convergence of data with weak ordering because we predefine the conflict resolution policy. And when we combine CRDTs with a weak isolation, highly available transaction protocol, we in the end get visibility that respects causality, so we get that relative order visibility. We avoid the need for aborts because we always can merge concurrent updates because they already are built on CRDTs that have a predefined convergence policy. And then finally, we can get atomic commitment of updates, so all or nothing visibility. So this is great. And I've shown you a communication system that gives you causality. I've shown you CRDTs. I've shown you highly available transactions. And I've told you that out of those three invariants, I can enforce the relative ordering invariants, and I can enforce the atomicity invariants. That's great. So what about the precondition invariants? So static analysis, or a form of verification and static analysis. So that title is wrong. But anyway. So the problem here to demonstrate of, of this precondition invariant again is that if I have Alice and Bob who use a joint banking account, both check the balance of the account, and the balance is 500. I, this is causally consistent. You know, everything's fine, no coordination. But the problem happens when they both attempt to withdraw $500. Or let's say one is trying to withdraw $501. And our invariant is that the balance of the bank account needs to be non-negative. And so this is a problem because this is an invariant that we cannot enforce unless we isolate these transactions from one another, and we know that these transactions are going to cause the invariant to be violated based on these preconditions and these postconditions that we have. And so this is very, very much work in progress. Uh, it's a paper by my colleagues at Popple a few years ago on an, in, on an initial approach for this, and now we're kind of trying to explore how we might apply this to microservice architectures and more general applications and not just the specific applications we've worked with previously. But the idea here is that what we want to do is specify application invariants that should hold. And we need to examine all of the possible concurrent operations that will run with those invariants and ensure that the invariant is stable under these operations. So we would say the invariant is this non-negative balance, and we would see that, well, a withdrawal of 500 and a withdrawal of 501, for instance, would cause this to be violated. So we would compare all possible combinations of operations that can concurrently run to determine if the invariant is, the, is stable under these operations. Now once we do that, now we know where we need to coordinate. And so we can instrument applications or perform some sort of code synthesis to add some sort of mutual exclusion, some sort of distributed fence, if you will, to prevent these operations from running concurrently together. Okay. And so the techniques here uh, that, have been, that have been looked at by a variety of my colleagues and that we're going to continue looking at in the future here are how can we annotate a program accordingly with this logic that currently, at least in this work called SciZ, is done using uh, first order predicate logic uh, through a language called Boogie. We want to try to figure out how we can determine this and perform the analysis. So the analysis is very straightforward once you get the annotations right, but there's always this challenge of how do you ensure your annotations match your actual implementation. This is kind of one of the big verification challenges uh, you know, to prove that programs are sound. Okay, 
And so that's kind of the story so far, and it's very much a work in progress. And so kind of, I'm gonna just try to wrap up and leave you with some interesting points here. Um, and it's basically just reiterating in the beginning. So again, consensus is safe. We like systems like Cloud Spanner. We're willing to pay for systems like Cloud Spanner and CockroachDB, sometimes in terms of performance, sometimes in terms of money, depending on which one you pick. We like to pick these because these systems are safe and they're very easy to program. And, and they're very easy to program because our, our, our computing models today for building distributed programs assume shared memory. And because of this, and, and they assume kind of imperative programming, because of this, having a total order over memory locations is very, very nice. It's very easy to reason about. And obviously this limits fault tolerance and high scalability, and high availability. And uh, you know, an example of this is with at least, you know, Spanner, Cockroach GP is kind of like an open source Spanner without true time, and no longer is the system strict serializable, it's now serializable, and then you sacrifice some other guarantees, like the performance is much slower because you have to wait much longer if you're using NTP and you don't have atomic clocks. And so you pay for this, and you're going to pay for this on some metric, whether it's fault tolerance or performance or latency or whatnot. Um, weak consistency and weak isolation enable performance. There are an insane number of weak isolation protocols. Parallel set, I mean, uh, if you look at some of these things, you have Cure, General Rain, Iger, Walter, all these things. There's all of these protocols that either provide weak isolation or causal consistency or stuff like that, but nobody knows what protocol is right because there's too many of them and the subtleties are so small because somebody's PhD thesis depended on them finding a difference between two protocols. And so they did, and now we have another. And so the challenge here is that we need to know when it's safe to be weak, and we need to know which protocols we can use. And so at least where I think the work, and the interesting work to be done is, is that we want to provide language support for doing this. We want to have languages where we get strong messaging guarantees built into language, so we don't have to write all of that nasty serialization and communications code ourselves. It's a waste of time, cognitive overhead. We want to have transactional semantics so that we can do things together and not always have to write code that assumes that every possible thing can fail because that's not fun. And, and finally, we want to have static analysis so that we can know exactly the places where we need to be strong. And then we can be weak everywhere else and it's like we were running with a total order all alone. Okay? So thank you very much. Anybody has questions? If you have drunk us? Uh, one thing I've always been, uh, I guess, sort of scared about uh, weak, uh, weak consistency in certain key systems is uh, the boundary for a merge to happen is. Technically, it is unbounded, right? Uh, a merge can uh, eventually never happen. Are there systems that take this into account and like maybe monitor this and, and bring awareness over whether merges are not happening? Yeah, it's a great question. So the garbage collection problem is, the garbage collection problem is directly related to this merge problem, right? And so the garbage collection problem is interesting because, uh, you know, when I at least worked on React, we, we so before the CRDTs that generated no garbage were invented, there were CRDTs that generated a real lot of garbage. And so we're like, that's fine, let's do distributed garbage collection, it's easy, right? And so you always had like some message or like some value on disk that like you thought was gone. And then like two months later it comes back and then all the garbage comes back. And like that sucks, right? And so uh, that's a, it's a really big challenge. Um, so I'll just highlight two bits of work that you may find interesting to follow up on. So one is Peter Bayless did an analysis on databases that called probabilistically bounded staleness. And what this says is you can look at how often nodes exchange, you'll know the diameter of the network, you'll know the exchange interval, you'll know possible levels of throughput on value changes, and you can place a very, very, uh, a very, very high confidence bound on how long convergence will take. So that's probabilistic. The second approach is using uh, a technique like with uh, like causal stability or some sort of thing that computes a lower bound. So if all of your objects are tagged with a growing identifier, you can compute a lower bound, and then you know that lower bound is safe. So that basically serves as a memory fence in essence, to say that all of the stuff that happened before here has happened, and so I know it's safe. And so, kind of your question was about merges, but knowing when everything has been merged is very much a garbage collection problem because it's knowing when I no longer need that value to be merged, or the value I would have to merge. 
¿Una pregunta? Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you test on all this? Uh, do you have uh, some practice to recreate all these environments, or some chaos inside of the data center? How, how sure. That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Uh, all right. So to test scalability, so I wasn't happy that these protocols had only been tested in a simulator. So I got a grant from the EU, and uh, they gave me 9,900 euros of taxpayers' money for me to spend on Amazon. And I was able to run two experiments that ran for 30 minutes at, 9, at, 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 at 1,500 nodes. Um, so I will say, first of all, it's very expensive. Because like 9,900 euros, that's like half of a grad student's salary for the year, right? And I blew it all in a matter of 30 minutes. Um, so that's very difficult to do. So testing large scale things is problematic. And all of my new testing has been done on Lambda. So I literally retrofitted Lambda instances with like backdoor communication between them. And I figured out how I could run Lambda instances for five minutes and simulate all sorts of interesting things. So much so that the head of Amazon Lambda mailed me. So I feel like I take that as a personal triumph. And uh, finally, the third bit is for fault injection, uh, our partisan communications layer has deterministic fault injection built in. And now, what I'm, if you saw uh, the keynote earlier today on, on testing property-based testing, we have a stateful property-based test that we're working on now that will start a cluster of nodes. It will add and remove nodes while the cluster is performing operations, so reading and writing or sending messages. And it will deterministically inject faults. And so that great stuff that you saw about how you can shrink tests, we can shrink distributed tests. If, our, if everything is deterministic, we can deterministically inject faults and remove nodes and add nodes, we can shrink a test and we can say, yeah, the minimal example was like I, I added this node and then I wrote to not a full quorum and then I tried to read it after I removed the node that had the value. And so it's a combination of techniques and, uh, and we, we constantly are thinking about how we have to build this in when we build the software. So it's, it's part of the design process, at least in my Thank you. De paso aprovechamos porque hay un problema técnico, pero um, I have a question I always do to people that work or are specialized on distributed system. Uh, what do you recommend reading or studying or like what, how do you practice if you are not like doing a PhD or if you are if you are, you are if you are an engineer or you normally work for a company, how do you get to know more about distributed system? Yeah, um, so at least if you want the academic view of things, which is incredibly grim and terrible, so like, you know, if you, the academic view, there's a really great book called uh, Reliable and Secure Distributed Programming. It's written by people at my university, Technical. And, uh, and it's a great book, but it paints a really bleak picture because it's like, oh man, failure detection, it's unsolvable. And like, you know, consensus, if one node fails and everything's asynchronous, it's unsolvable. And like, you come away with this like, you know, how does Zookeeper even work? Like, how does that as a piece of software? Is it terribly broken? Turns out Zookeeper is one of the best around. So uh, that, the academic view is really, really sad. Uh, from the practical point of view, um, I don't know. I, I guess I guess things that I find interesting are I like looking at things like systems like Microsoft Orleans, seeing how they build systems. So Orleans is a great system because they write a ton of academic papers. They give a lot of academic talks. But uh, it makes real world trade offs. They say sometimes under failure, this thing that's only supposed to be running once is running twice. And it will be for like 30 minutes until the system corrects it. And so we'll just deal with that. And so Orleans is like an academic type thing, but like with a real, real world spin on it. Uh, and they say, yeah, this thing's unsolvable. So whatever, we'll do the best effort we can because we are building Halo and we need to make something work. So, uh, so I think kind of looking at existing projects and then and then figuring out maybe the algorithms that they're using and then looking at the algorithms. And finally, I will highly recommend uh, the paper called Paxos Made Live, which is about how they productionize the Paxos algorithm for the Chubby system at Google. Um, and that says that paper is great because that paper is a real world trade-off paper that said. Here's the here's the constraints. I need to solve this thing in the real world, so we got to make it work. And like, here's what we figured out, and here's all the things we learned. So those kind of experience report papers are really good as well. Yeah.